Well, here we are back again. How nice to see you all again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Reverend David Hayward, and this, my awesome angels of the absolute, this is CSA Sunday, and yes, indeed, we are off to the races with, woo! Another extraordinary brand new talk from Dr. Bill Little. We have got incredible music. We have a wonderful youth group run. We've got affirmative prayer treatments. We have got food. We have got delicious food. And we have got a circle group afterwards. Can you believe it? How lucky you're here this morning. And we are thrilled to have you with us. Ah. All right. Um, I, don't, I was thinking about Guru Mai this week. And uh, I don't know why, but she always used to start everything and finish everything with great respect and love with great respect and love and I always loved that so with great respect and love we welcome you here this morning and um, the other thing I was remembering oh well, it must be must have been back in the early 90s or mid 90s or something dr. Bill took us all up to see Guru Mai for Shakti Pai and uh, it was, a, it was a great experience, and uh, I remember there was a Swami there that I liked a lot, and he kept sort of not interrupting exactly, um, but he would talk a little bit, and then he would, he would start shouting out, Sad Guru Nath Maharaj Ki Jai, which was a deep honoring of the teacher and the guru. So I wanted to do that a little bit this morning, right? So I will shout out, Sadguru Nath, and you will shout back to me, Maharaj Ki Jai. And we will do that in honor of Dr. Bill and his teaching and his lineage. So, all right. Sadguru Nath Ki Jai. All right. Awesome. And the other thing I wanted to start with this morning <laughs> Sadguru Nath Ki, Ki Jai. All right. Yeah, that's very. Um, when it gets to the end of the service, sometimes I lose names, and I—I I, I was really—I just want to. In, I wanted to apologize to Dr. Timothy because I felt really bad last week that you know it, we got to the end of the service, and I just—I absolutely blanked on Dr. Timothy's name. And I, and I could tell you that that was because I was in an altered state, or I was in <laughs> bliss, or I was like, but it's, it's really that I'm actually getting much older and these things kind of <laughs> happen. But I just wondered, Dr. Timothy, would you stand so that we could just all give you a huge amount of love and applause. And... <laughs> Thank you so much for all you do. Really, really deep, deep honoring. Okay, on with the motley. Here we go. Well, I guess we should stand and sing in this very room, should we? All right. is in this room this morning. I'm so excited. Rachel is sitting right in the front row and Rachel Williams is going to come and sing for us today. <laughs> Sad good enough. <laughs> All right. That's very good. <laughs> the wonderful, the extraordinary 
Lisa Petty is here today with news of Junior Church. Oh my God! Did you try the le- did you try the, the 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 lemonade that the kids made a few weeks ago? It was ex it's exquisite, really. It's very good. Hello. This is my first time back since our break, and it's so nice to be here. Uh, We are talking about beauty today, and (laughs) it's funny because I always like to read the definition of the words we're doing, and beauty, I didn't really love it because it was like a car or a woman, you know, when they're describing a beauty, and it's like, oh my God, it's so much more than that. So I found a definition I really liked of beauty, and it's the quality or aggregate of qualities in a person or thing that gives pleasure to the senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or spirit. I thought, that's the definition of beauty I can get behind. You know, I like that one. So, you know, we're going to take a walk, and I'm going to have the kids collect things that they think are, think, think are things of beauty, and we're going to share it with each other. But we're also going to talk about a different kind of beauty. Amelia and I have been talking about happy accidents lately and finding beauty in mistakes and finding beauty in times of stress. And the easiest example is we went to pick up food the other day, and I realized I had forgotten to order her burrito a crime, right? And so I had to order it at the restaurant, and we spent about 25 minutes just sitting in the restaurant together playing. And she looked at me and goes, Mom, this is the best time. I said, well, I forgot your food, so that's the only reason we're here. And then I thought, well, let's talk about that. This is called a happy accident. If I hadn't made this mistake, we wouldn't be sitting here playing together, having this great time, and that's beautiful. So can we find that beauty in those moments? And it's easier once you get a a bit older and can have hindsight and you have your old frontal lobe and you can process that kind of thing. But you know, for kids, can we, can we find that, that beauty and kind of the tough stuff? We're also going to read the rainbow fish, which is about the most beautiful fish in the sea, but it finds itself very lonely because it's so beautiful. So it learns to share its beauty with everyone else and then finds the beauty of the community once it you know, has all these beautiful fish with it. So if the kids want to join me, I have a rowdy crew today. We are going to have a good time down there. I know we are. (laughs) Come on up, kiddos. Hey-ho, I feel so free, because God's having fun just being. Ready. Yes, sir, Bob. It's one happy fine song, ain't it? All right. <laughs> well, if you're here for the first time, or <laughs> if you're here for the last time, there's a <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> it's really good to have you here. And uh <laughs> um, Anyway, we have a little, the whole thing is that we have a little gift and we just love to give it to you to let you know that we, um, we graciously accept your wonderful presence in our midst and, uh, and thank you for coming. We, we love it. So, if you want to, if you, anybody here and they'd like to put their hand up, Tommy will be, be around to see you and uh, thanks again to everyone. Uh, the magical time of day when we silence our cell phones for a few minutes, if we could possibly dare to be without them. And um, here we go. And then, wow, this is great. We're very proud to be able to announce this morning that Mike Noble is our practitioner. So here he is with the health treatment, Mike Noble. Good morning. What um, I would like to do is do a, a health treatment, and I'd like to give you all the opportunity to include anybody that you know, friends or family, in the treatment. So I'll ask you to raise your hand, and I'll go around. We'll, you can mention that person's first name, and then we'll include them in this prayer treatment. It's a treatment for wellness, health, uh, mental, emotional, physical health, well-being, spiritual well-being. So anybody here that have someone you want to include? Sure. John and Jim and Judy and Eric. 
John, Jim, Judy, and Eric. Lisa, Katie, and Kim. Lisa, Katie, and Kim. Cynthia and Linda. Yes. Linda. Linda. I'm sorry. <laughs> Looking over you. <laughs> Beth, Jonathan, Sarah, and Renee. Beth, Jonathan, Sarah, and Renee. Okay. Yes. Sandy and Marilyn. Sandy and Marilyn. Barbara. Barbara. Rich. Rich. Crystal. Crystal. In the back there? Mickey. Mickey. Oh, right next to you. Um, Nikki, Matthew, Ramon. Oh, wow. Nikki, Matthew, and who? Okay, okay Ramon. Yes. Kelsey, Daniel, Trish, and Sandy. Kelsey, Daniel, Trish, and who? David. 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 Okay. Tanya and Keith. Tanya and Keith. John. John. Okay. Shelby. Shelby. This side, okay? Martha, Mary, Carol, Barbara, and Ralph. Okay, I'm gonna include all of those. <laughs> Susan, and Judy, and their families. Susan, Judy, and their families, okay. Marty. Marty? Justin, Just wife, Mary, and Mark. Okay. Delphi. 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 John? Okay. And Lee. And Lee. Okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, Coleman, Jesse, and Mr. Freeman. Coleman, Jesse, and Mr. Freeman? Yeah. Susan. Susan. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just kind of close our eyes and relax a minute. Get in the moment. There is one infinitely loving and intelligent mind one consciousness, one source of energy and matter in the universe. And that is our mind. It is God's mind in us as us now. The infinite universal consciousness is in every one of us. And as us is God's mind, God's consciousness, the collective universal consciousness that has manifested in everyone and everything we see or do. It is God simultaneously interacting with everyone and everything. We have the power to manifest anything in our lives. It is all part of our individual and collective consciousness. It is the universe infinitely loving and intelligent mind. It is God's mind now. We live full, healthy, and productive lives, free from stress, free from mental or physical pain and limitations. We are collectively transitioning, entering a phase of great global prosperity, love, and wellness. Our lives are abundant, filled with everyone and everything we need or want in life. We know no limitations in this life or the lives of our friends and family or community. Life is what we believe it to be, what we hold it to be, and we joyously manifest ourselves with each other. We all share in community love and caring for each other. Therefore, I release this treatment to the universe knowing that extreme joy and abundance and aware that there is no suffering from lack, illness, physical or psychological limitations. God's loving single consciousness and intelligent mind is our mind. It is us, it is in us, and therefore all is well. Thank you, God. And after the, the service, uh, Reverend Shreya and I will be in the back for any individual treatments if you want to come back and see us. And thank you. Mike, thank you so much. Tell you what's going on with me. I think if, if there's only this one presence, right, which we pretty much all 
buy into. And, and I think most of us by now can sort of feel it. And there's a credibly loving nature to it. In order to receive that, we have to love ourselves. And so when I say you're awesome angels of the absolute, it's because it's true. And you are. And we all are. And the more we can accept, accept that, the more we can bring that love to ourselves, then the more we can receive and the more we can generate it too. So do not buy into the fact that you are anything perfect but that love and you are fabulous and perfect the way you are. And that's the way God made you, so don't buy into the fact that anybody else wants to change you. None of their darn business. Tell them Reverend David Haywood thinks you're perfect. <laughs> All right, moving right on. Oh, I'm very excited about this today. Dr. Bill's topic is the Heart Sutra, so I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, yes, sir, I am. And now I can't wait to introduce who? Dennis Murphy, Michael Martinez, and the incredible Rachel Williams. Woo! <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Rachel's got some wonderful product for sale in the in the community room after church if you want to check it out. Thank you.
Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, the, um, the power of words, or even syllables, was studied in great detail by especially the Hindus. They loved the theory of vibration. <clears throat> That's what a word is, right? It's a vibration. The symbol ya at the end of Alleluia sends everything up into the crown chakra. Whatever you've been chanting, Alleluia is a beautiful word. It celebrates divinity. It sends it right up into the top of your head. Every syllable counts. Well, you know, we have a history of great scriptures. Oh, you got that one. I love that. Isn't that nice? It's, I don't think it's on our coast. It's somewhere else, but there it is, the heart. Scriptures were written down by enlightened beings for a reason. They weren't just wasting their time. They were creating something that hopefully hundreds or even thousands of years later, would be useful to people, would help them navigate their way through a very complex experience called human life. An experience that has a lot of highs and a lot of lows. It is not easy. So navigating, helping people was their purpose. They may even tell us how our model of reality needs to be adjusted. They may have some suggestions about how to live life well. You know, over the years, we've tended to drift away from the help of great beings, great masters. There are some people who honor them today. But in general, people are honoring science more or TV series <laughs> or, you know, these kinds of things. And we forget that there's always been help. There's always been wisdom. There's always been the gift of others' love the grace of people such as Guru Mai. Hmm? That sentence that you had us say is a very powerful sentence. It's a sentence of surrender. Surrender to the teacher. Surrender all your thoughts. Surrender your beliefs. Why would we do that? You know, immediately the left brain kicks in and says, well, but I, I like these beliefs. I spent a whole time getting them. <laughs> or shall we say, stealing them from other people. Yeah. But what if they're wrong? If they're wrong, then it doesn't matter how long you've spent getting them, they're wrong. We're going to look at a scripture today that is that way. It's puzzled people for thousands of years. It's about 2,500 years old. It's called the Heart Sutra. It comes mainly from Buddhism. Strangely enough, that's not the real title of it. <laughs> the real title is the Heart of Wisdom Sutra. It's not about the heart. It's about wisdom. Don't leave. It's OK. It'll have something to do with the heart, I'm sure. The word sutra means something that connects you to the divine. Sanskrit and Pali, which is a very similar language, um, the, the word sutra is very close to the English word suture. You know, if you get a cut, the doctor's going to do a suture. And that's it. Sews you up. And that's what sutra is. It's something that sews us to Divinity. Okay, that's good. 
You have a translation as you came in. You got a translation of the Heart Sutra. This has been a very disturbing kind of teaching for a long time. And many people have translated it, trying to get it to be more understandable. The thing that gets everybody are two sentences right in the middle of it. Form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. That which is form is emptiness. That which is emptiness is form. At that point, these um, excuses for leaving the room come up. Yeah, that can't be true. Form, everywhere, that's, that, that's what our, our world is made of form, right? Our world is made of what we call objects. We are very objective beings. What could this mean? Well, as they've looked at this over the years, they've come to the conclusion that you have to understand the word emptiness correctly for this to make any kind of sense. Emptiness of what? What's missing here? Form does not differ from emptiness. Could it be the nothingness? Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, form is form. It's not nothing. It has attributes. We can describe it. We can use it and so forth. So that doesn't make sense. What has been decided is the emptiness being spoken of is an emptiness of a sense of self a sense of existence, individual existence. We have to look at examples. To get this across, it's subtle. Okay. You see a piano there. Okay. Does it exist? Buddhism says, no, it doesn't exist. Until you make it exist. How do you make it exist? Well, you shed your consciousness on it. That's the first step. The second step is, how do you interpret what you see? You know, beautiful piano like that, it might take you back to your childhood. You had one in your childhood and you remember. You remember the lessons and how fun it was and so forth. Another person would remember the lessons and how terrible it was. You know, so it's going to have a slightly different meaning to that person. Huh? And then Michael's going to get up and play it, and you'll fall in love with the piano and Michael and everything else. Yeah. In other words, there isn't a specific identity, a self, to that piano. What there is, is what we are, what we bring to it, what we shed upon it. Hmm? It's, that's what the sutra is talking about. We think this objective world is a total agreement. Everyone knows, you know, there's a windows, and I don't know what those lights are, but there they are. That's something new. When did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember those. I have no, like, no location and memory to know what. I, I can't give that a meaning. Okay, so there it is. <laughs> All right. But the, the whole idea is there is no separate existence to any form at all. There's only what we say there is. Hmm. This world of otherness is a sensory based world. The problem with human beings is that our senses are extremely limited. There are many animals that have better senses than we do. And we have to accept that. We're not able to change it, so we accept it. Okay. 
But then we also have to accept that maybe we're making some mistakes in about what is our world, who are we, what's going on here. It may be that we don't see it correctly as a, a kind of um, inability to perceive things the way they really are, just because we are, by design, too limited. But it's very difficult for us to do that. We have something called ego. It's a sense of I. And because it's limited, it doesn't want to tell anybody about that. It would rather not be limited. <laughs> There's even something called spiritual ego. Yep, we think we know everything. And the great beings have said, that's the last level of ego. You've got to be very careful with that one because it will prevent you from really breaking through. Yeah. Well, what is ego? It's a very small, contracted sense of I. It lives in a body. Even though it knows the body's going to die, it still lives in it and is in control of it. And you know, it does all these foolish things and is absolutely sure it's right. Storms, capitals on January 6th, and so forth and so on. It does all these things that you say, what's going on? What's happening? What are these people doing? What thoughts are they using? When you first start reading the Heart Sutra, the ego will bring up certain phrases. How about, uh, it's just an ancient philosophy? Or how about something like, well, I'm not a Buddhist anyway. I don't have to understand that. Yeah. But what if this sutra actually is capable of creating a totally new model of life? What are we living in? Is the model we have correct? Is it severely limited? And if so, what's a better one? What's going to replace it that will make my life better? You know, various teachers through the ages have alluded to a new model. And either we've gotten it or we haven't. Jesus, for example, he said, you need to be born again. And that's a new model. He said, you have to be born again in the same body, but you're born in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> and the ego sits there and thinks, OK, I'm a born again Christian. And nothing has happened. It's just, we're, you know, these people are exactly the same as they were five minutes before. What does he mean by that? Well, today we're going to find out what he means. We can change that two-sentence thing in the Heart Sutra. We can put in what we know now. Form has no independent existence. Emptiness is full of interconnections and energies. It is a description of the interrelated and ever-changing nature of everything. That's what the Heart Sutra is about. That is a wise way to realize what this world is. I'll say it again. Form has no independent existence. It depends on you. Emptiness is full of interconnections and energies. Are we full of interconnections and energies? Yeah, of course. We're connected to parents, then we're connected to siblings in school, then we're connected to teachers, and then we're connected to jobs, and so forth and so on. Oh, yeah. Do our energies change? Yes. Well, then form, its meaning, changes. You see, what we do with form, the basic thing we do with form is we say, oh, that's other than me. And the word other is the one that sinks it. Other. It's not me. 
when the truth is, it is me, because I'm the one who interprets the meaning of it. And does that make a difference? Huge. How about relationships? Hmm? Has anyone ever been in a relationship? <laughs> no. OK, you're all brand new. All right, good. <laughs> How about been in a relationship that didn't work? Come on. Mm -hmm. A few? Oh, just a couple. All right. Well, for those people. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet that in that relationship that didn't work, you never once thought that this person is me. Yeah, right? Yeah, we don't do that. You see, the word other to us means, I have nothing to do with that. But the truth is, we do have something to do with that. We are the ones who interpret what the relationship is. Can we do it wisely, according to the Heart Sutra, the Heart of Wisdom? Sure. But we have to learn it. We have to contemplate it. We have to learn something new about reality. And it's not just relationships. It has to do with many, many things. Suppose, for example, that you're walking down, taking your daily walk in the forest or something like that. And all of a sudden, there's a little bird a few feet away, and it starts singing. I have one just like that in my backyard. I can look out over my deck. Looks exactly like that. Oh, that's a different color. But they start singing, you know, <clears throat> for quite a while. Um, for some reason, I don't know. There were lots of crows in, living in the back in the forest. And I, I missed the, the bird songs from the smaller birds, you know, the sweet energies. Now they're back. And it's amazing to hear them. You know, you hear this wonderful, beautiful animal singing. Science tells us that birds are the evolution of dinosaurs. That's quite an evolution. You know? I don't think the dinosaurs could sing. But I guess God changed his mind. He said, all right, we'll make them sing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but... It's so beautiful. And you feel happy after that. You feel something changes inside you. Your energy changes. Huh? OK? That means you are connected to that event of a bird singing. Hmm? Don't say it's other than you. It is not other than you. It just changed you. Hmm? If you've ever seen um, these uh, wonderful pictures that they can take of the body now showing you where your energy is, how it's moving, and so look, there you, I don't even, maybe Tim knows what they call all that, but anyway, there it is. You see that, you see the wonderful mechanism of your body, how complex, how effective, how powerful. I was watching um, a young lady who's, I'm sure, gonna be on the, in the next Olympics, She's a gymnast, Suni Lee. Have you seen her? Unbelievable. The human body can move that fast and that precisely. Unbelievable. So what that does is, is put a, a sense of amazement into life. Why? Is that other? No, you've just been amazed by looking at this person do the bars and the flipping and the so forth. Amazing. Imagine that you're having a conversation with someone you know, perhaps a loved one. That's energy going back and forth a lot. You know, body language, vocal language, you know, all of that is being shared. You're in a dynamic energy field. Now, to get back to the idea of relationships, suppose you have one person in the relationship who's a female, and she is mothering. 
and there's a male, and he is providing. Okay, and they've got to get along. And maybe there's some problems with that timing or, you know, okay, you've got to take care of the child here and so forth and so on. That timing and those problems are only going to work out correctly if they use wisdom. What wisdom? A specific wisdom. And that wisdom is, this is not an other person. This is me sharing their ideas, their life. But that's a part of me. It's my life, too. Unless the two people realize that they are truly partnering and they're reflecting each other and they understand each other's point of view, now some choices can be made that are wise. Hmm? Then it works. Our individual thinking when we're alone, left brain, whatever, talking about ideas, but in our own mind, is extremely dualistic. We don't think we're dualistic. We think we have our opinion and that's it. That's the only opinion. That's the way to get a painful life. That's called narcissism. You stick in that and you're going to be painful. Hmm? The Dalai Lama gave a, an example of this in, in a video years ago. He was asked about the Heart Sutra, several questions. And he said, you know, if I say, there's no elephant in this room, that's a statement. It's a statement about this thing called an elephant. No one's going to understand or even begin to accept that statement if they've never met an elephant. Hmm? In other words, they've had to be somewhere where there was an elephant to know what he's talking about. So the contrapositive of what he said is necessary to understand what he's, the thought he's sharing. If there's no elephant, no elephant is in this room, you have to understand what it would be like to have an elephant in the room. So a statement and a reverse of the statement, they're always, always together. They're always bound together. You can't do one without the other. Now, we may be in emphasizing the lack of the elephant, but we still have to know what an elephant is, or else it's a meaningless statement. If I had a, a bunch of paper here, a paper pad, a large, big one, and I wanted to draw Snoopy, I would get out a marker, and I, you know, little nose there, and uh, oh, the ears, the ears are everywhere. You know, Snoopy's ears are like that. Okay, and finally, I'm finished. There's Snoopy. Nope. There's Snoopy, and then there's not Snoopy. All right. Yeah, everybody can see Snoopy. But if you're an artist, then you know what negative space is. You know that's the space around Snoopy. And just as important as Snoopy. And it is impossible not to have negative space and just positive space. That you can't do. Because you've only got one piece of paper. You gotta have both, right? The same thing is true with our thinking. Our logical thinking is made up of dualism. There's this or there's not this. Yeah. That kind of thing. So if we're going to have a working model of the universe that we can live with, grow in, and benefit from, then I'd suggest that the universe is much more like an ocean of energies that are changing, changing very rapidly. They're changing into, an, into each other. 
It's sort of like they, they move back and forth. It's not a bunch of fixed things. And that includes us. We are not fixed things, even though we struggle egotistically to be fixed. These are my opinions. I don't, don't change. And so you, you can't do that. If you do that, there will be pain. The universe doesn't want that. It wants a dynamic, a dynamic flow. That's why Taoism is one of the most interesting religions there is, because that's their model. It's an oceanic model. I think of um, going down here to the aquarium, looking at the fish. Have you noticed how relaxing that is? It's just wonderful. You can stand there, you think you're going to be there for a few minutes, and then a half hour later, you're still. You know. it, the ocean, we have three biomes on our planet. We have the air and the air beings, the, the birds. We have land, that's mainly where we are. Uh, but we have the sea also. And the sea is a completely different world. It's, uh, it has different creatures. And they're basically very graceful, very relaxing. And it's constantly changing, you know? I'm sure they don't have any fixed ideas. The fish just float around. Whatever happens, happens, and that's it. You know? They seem to be okay with that. This is nothing new. This idea of moving to a different model of reality and trying it out and seeing if it works. It, it, well, 2,500 years ago, there's a sutra there. It's telling you, change your model of reality. OK. So the ancient seers, they understood the interdependency of thoughts. They understood the interdependency of people on each other, as well as the land, the sun, the stars, the oceans, and so forth. They understood that this is a oneness. The ancient seers, uh, there's an Indian one, and there's um, Middle Eastern, Greek. Yeah. They were found in many lands. These are the people who lived on the planet thousands of years ago. They knew this. They had lots of time for meditation. And they were introspective. They did what we call today mindfulness meditation, watch their thinking. And they got a lot out of that. And they determined these scriptures, which today shock us, but to them were very reasonable, you know? Right? Everything's dynamic, everything's what I say, and it can change in a moment. Hmm. But they did say, they added to their comments, that people who study the outside world versus the inside world, the ones who are later were called scientists and looked at the outside world, would come to the same conclusions that they were coming to, that there really is only one thing happening. But they said it would take a long time. They were right. A hundred years ago, approximately, scientists discovered the quantum realm. That is a huge breakthrough for any race, for any species, to discover a completely different realm. It's reality, but its rules, its laws, are nothing like ours. And it's the foundation of our reality. So we're getting a glimpse into the huge mistake we're making, and that is nothing is fixed, nothing is other. <laughs> Quantum mechanics is exactly the opposite. This picture here is a diagram. It's obviously done by an Fine art, America there. Are those two blue balls, 
consider them to be two elementary particles. Now, elementary particles are subatomic. They're so small that we're never going to be able to perceive them with our senses. But they were discovered about 100 years ago. OK. If those two particles initially are somehow tied together, now, particles do have certain attributes. There's no point in going into it here. They're kind of esoteric, so we'll just skip that part. But let's say the arrows that you see there, one's pointing up, one's pointing down. That represents two orientations of the same attribute. Actually, that, that one would be called spin. Do they spin? We don't know. We can't see them, but we'll call it spin. You know, that's the way science is. OK. So they have one has spin up, one has spin down. OK? And just maybe they were created in the same, oh, and, and, the, and the, we have the particle accelerators all over the place. They could be created in that same particle accelerator. And they're a pair, you know, to begin with. If you take those particles and separate them and separate them and separate them, and you take them out to the ends of the universe, which is a long way away. This one, as it has been up, flips. This one instantly flips. Instantly. It would take light billions of years to travel that distance to communicate that this one had flipped. But this one instantly flips. What's going on there? This is called the entanglement thing. These are entangled particles. Do we know what that means? And the answer is no, we don't know what that means. But the indication is the two things are related to each other in an extremely fundamental way. In a sense, they are each other. There's no difference. That's astounding. And they're separated by a universe. That's quantum mechanics. That's what the quantum realm is like. So is it talking about things that we are seeing in the ancient scriptures? Yes. As a matter of fact, when, when we first discovered quantum physics, there was a group of people who worked on them very much. Uh, they were always together, Heisenberg, uh, Einstein, Bohr, all these people. They said, you know, we can't understand this. Bohr one time wrote a letter to everybody saying, we could be crazy. We might be insane. Okay. They really, it's, it was so different that they said, this is impossible. But as time went on, they realized, no, we're not crazy. It really happens. The only way they, get, they had any peace of mind at all is to go back into history to see if there was anything historically in scientific papers or even in spiritual writings that is similar to what's going on. And they said the only document we could find that helped was the Bhagavad Gita of Hinduism, thousands of years old. So did the seers see all this inside? Did they see a reality that is constantly changing and is constantly, the word is interdependent, a network, a fluid, a space where everything is changing everything constantly. They saw that. They were right in predicting. It took a couple thousand years, but here we are. That's when we verified what the ancients said. That's a big breakthrough for a race. Because at that point, because when we know that we were wrong, we can gradually, we don't want to do it too fast because that's embarrassing, but we can gradually switch over to the right understanding of the universe and create tablets, digital tablets, cell phones. We can even create spaceships that go to other planets, which means that there's a vast potential for expansion. Well, that vast potential for expansion is 
also occurring on an individual level. When we understand that we are the ones who interpret everything, and therefore everything can change, because we can change our interpretation. When we get that, well, that makes a tremendous difference. You know, when we come up against something in our lives that is difficult, it could be an illness, a death of a friend, these things that make us very sad, we have to realize that the universe has a program that we have not been able to see because we didn't see the universe correctly. The universe is constantly changing from one situation into its opposite and then back to the first and then into its opposite. It's constantly going between two situations. Either there's an elephant in the room or there's not an elephant in the room. If there's not an elephant in the room, at some point there'll be an elephant in the room. So let's say, you know, the doctor says, you know, there's something wrong here. We've got to do something about this thing in the body. Okay, it's an illness. Our job in this is not to do the doctor's job. They, do, they know their job. They do it very well. Our job is to realize that this could change into its opposite at any point. No. Let's look at some examples of how this works. In other words, what can we learn from realizing there is a different kind of reality here than we thought? Well, <clears throat> one thing we could do is start meditating. If we haven't, start. Adya Shanti talked about this. When you rest in meditation and your image of yourself fades, what's left? A brightness, a radiant emptiness that is simply what you are. So meditation is the practice that's going to get you used to what you really are. It's beyond your personality. But it's surprisingly easy to enter. You know, just some particular technique, mantra, whatever it is, sounds of some sort. And you go into this space where the mind is stopped. But you still are. No thinking, no senses, just being. A radiant emptiness, a brightness. Hmm? Now it's good to do that because that actually is beyond the pairs of opposites. The mind is where the pairs of opposites occur. But beyond those pairs of opposites, you do really have a self. And that self is not like a human being at all. So all of these sutras are coming along and saying, here's what your reality is like, but you should also experience what you really are, your true being, which is just that stillness, that radiant emptiness. There's nothing in it. There's nothing that changes. It's changeless. Get used to the fact that this outer world is going to change. It does flip all the time. If that's so, then nothing should disturb you. Let's say you're having a problem. Let's say you don't have the income you want. And you're worried about that. OK. You can take the proper measures. You know, you could. Uh, Re-educate, you could do all sorts of things, look for good jobs that pay more and so forth. But also realize 
that life itself will change that into its opposite. You just have to be patient. When we have these things that cause pain in us, you know what that pain really is? Let's do the next one. Idol Ahmed. You know great things are coming when everything seems to be going wrong. Old energy is clearing out for new energy to enter. Be patient. You see, that's, that is a practice that only comes by understanding the pairs of opposites and not arguing against them, but cooperating with them. Hmm? But look at that, it's so well phrased. You know great things are coming when everything seems to be going wrong. Old energy is clearing out for new energy to enter. You know, it's foolish for us to say, oh, I don't have any old energy that needs clearing out. We all do. Otherwise, there wouldn't be psychotherapists. I mean, come on. Of course we do. And it's very easy to pick up energy from others also. Extremely easy. All of that is something that needs to be, clean. it needs to be cleared out. Yeah. We need to take an inner shower every day. <laughs> really, we do. OK. So this back and forth thing, you know, having um, not enough money. OK. All right. That's going to cause feelings to come up. Hmm? You're going to have feelings about that, emotions. There's going to be anger, frustration, fear. You know, these kinds of things will come up. Let them come up. These are the dark energies that have been hidden, hidden in the subconscious mind. They've been there, but you haven't noticed them. Subconscious, you're not conscious of. Okay? So they come up when one of these events occurs. Let them come up. It's clearing out. It is literally. It's not, this is not just positive thinking. Don't think of it that way. Those energies coming to the conscious level the anger, the fear, the, the frustration, all of that coming to the conscious level is actually a healing process that the universe does automatically if you will do, if, if you'll understand that that's what it's doing. It wants to heal you. Yeah. For example, anger. Anger is a very destructive energy. One of the most destructive. That's the one that Jesus just absolutely, he, he was so em emphatic about anger. He, he wasn't that emphatic about anything else. Yeah, he said, but yeah, you can't do anger. Anger and judgment usually are very close together. He was very upset about those. So here's a good quote on anger. It's time to just be happy. Being angry, sad, and overthinking. Overthinking. Does everyone see that word, overthinking? That's for our left-brainers. If you're a left-brainer, you should see that word. Isn't worth it anymore. Just let things flow, flow, flow. All right. There's Buddhism. That's a Buddhist monk, but he's a Taoist also. Buddhism and Taoism are kissing cousins. You know, very similar. Be positive. Someone said, there's nothing sweeter than being absolutely still when a person does something to absolutely inflame you. <laughs> Just be still. <laughs> Don't react. That's all. You know, It's so simple. You see this new model of the changing interconnected universe, the dynamic interconnected universe, has its own rules. Yes, we're all connected. Yes, we've got to live that way. No, you can't get out of it, <laughs> <laughs> except for maybe meditation. You know, and it makes it, it makes it a different, a different way of being. You got to look at it again. 
Another very good idea has to do with relationships here. Gratitude. In Buddhism, the word emptiness is a translation of the Sanskrit sunyata. It means empty of a separate self. It is not a negative or despairing term. It is a celebration of interconnectedness, of interbeing. It means nothing can exist by itself alone, that everything is inextricably interconnected with everything else. I know that I must always work to remember that I am empty of a separate self and full of the many wonders of this universe, including the generosity of my grandparents and parents, the many friends and teachers who have helped and supported me along the path, and you, dear readers, without whom this book could not exist. We inter-are, and therefore we are empty of an identity that is separate from our interconnectedness. The author, Chan Gong. Learning true love, practicing Buddhism in a time of war. <laughs> And that really is the most powerful understanding. Because of our interconnectedness, we must be sure to always help other people, always. Because as Ramana Maharshi said in the last century, there are no other people. David mentioned uh, Guru Mai this, this morning. Her guru was Muktananda. We called him Baba. He had many one-liners that were fabulous. One of them was, think well of me, O my mind, and think well of others also. Hindus have a very good short one-word way of doing that. They use the mantra, Shivoham. Whenever you see another person, shivoham, shivoham, what does it mean? It means this too is Shiva, this too is divinity. Hmm? It's a good practice. He was very strong about it. He said, look, you can do it in this lifetime, that's great. Or you can do it five lifetimes from now, that's still great, but you're gonna have to beat the drum of shivoham. <laughs> All right, let's uh, finish on a kind of strange laughable note. We're looking at new models, an oceanic model. <clears throat> it, it works much better than anything else. The one that we, most of us use, let's face it, it's failing. You know, you have to go to something else. A few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I think in England, some biologi biological um, scientists were just investigating things. Uh, what they did is they, they took of the kind of pictures, I think they're called ultrasound, of the fetus in the womb. And uh, they would take many pictures, you know, right in a row. They were interested in month one and month two of the fetus in the womb. The, what happens, and I never knew this, the first organ to grow is the face. We get a face right at the very beginning. <laughs> and this particular scientist said, there's something on the face that nobody understands. It's called a philtrum. This thing here underneath the nose, that's the philtrum. Ask anybody, ask Dr. Tim. Nobody knows what it's for. <laughs> Where did it come from? Therefore, it's, it's likely a DNA situation. We inherit it from our ancestors. Well, everyone thinks that our ancestors are apes, right? We've been told that for ages. This particular film that they made, they, they digitalized the film, um, that was actually the, the um, ultrasound of the child, the fetus. This particular film shows you the development, it's a very short film. So watch closely, 
especially when you see the decision is we come from fish. We're more like fish than we are like apes. And it's not just the filtrum. There are other things that are true, too. Um, the idea is that we can live in an oceanic experience. We're used to an oceanic experience. And walking on land is only a recent thing. <laughs> you know? We can do it. It can feel right to us if we just take the concept and employ it, you know, make it a habit. Think about that concept, that this is me. And, oh, this thought is connected to this thought. And I'm moving in a very fluid dimension. If you want to really emphasize it, get some Taoism out. Read the Tao Te Ching again. It's all about fluid. It's a fluid universe. Yeah. Do that and see what happens. See if you don't relax more. You know, if the changes are just changes, that's all that's supposed to happen. There's, there are energies are flying in, energies are coming up to the conscious level, energies are leaving. All of that's quite nice. It's for the better. Yeah. Just try it. Fish, imagine that. Let's do a treatment. One of the great things about treatment is, of course, we teach it in classes and so forth. But treatment is not meant to be preordained, so to speak. It's not meant to be a series of steps. When Mike did the treatment this morning, you know, it was spontaneous. It came out of him. It's a, it's a movement in the practitioner or the minister or whoever. You know, it's, it's something moving. There's energies moving, and they come out, and that's what it is. So you don't have to memorize things with treatment. The basic structure is important, but then it's very fluid. So let's do our treatment. The word I is not a body, it's not a personality. The word I has to do with the sense of being. I don't have to do anything to be, I am. I don't need to change anything to achieve anything. I already am. The self is already here. I experience my life from that point of view. I see the beautiful movement of nature, seasons, times of day, animals, plants, friends. I see it all as a beautiful play. A play designed especially for, for me. It entertains, it causes growth. I go through the pairs of opposites with the sense of my being, which is transcendent. It transcends the pairs of opposites. I contribute to the play because I love it. I love the people in it. I love the wisdom of the ancients, which has helped me to understand who I really am. And I love the opportunities to express that wisdom. There's always help. We are never without help. We are not what our senses report. We're not a body. We're not limited. We 
We are awareness, consciousness. Always. Before we came here, we were consciousness. When we leave, we'll still be consciousness. We're just having a vacation on Earth. So it is.
Rachel Williams. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, you golden, radiant beings of light. As uh, Reverend David would say, yes, siri, Bob. My name is Reverend Shreya, and now it's time for conscious giving. So would the ushers please come forward? So this is the time for the offering. Now, don't think of this as transactional. I mean, even though we get a wonderful lesson every Sunday, we have fabulous treats, and, who, and the music, good gravy. But this isn't transactional. This is about clearing out energy and getting entangled on the other side. So let's clear out some energy. <laughs> Look for the envelope on the back of your seat. And if you're on YouTube, go to csa-pg.org and press that big red donate button. Now's the time. So together, let's read the prosperity affirmation, shall we? I say yes to the abundant flow of good in my life. I recognize God as the source of my supply. I know that as I give, so too shall I receive. Abundance and prosperity are my divine right. And so it is. So the ushers are gonna pass the basket now and give me just a little bit of time to invite you to come right through this door directly after service and join Dr. Noble and I for treatments, exchanging some of that energy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Um, thank you so much for your contribution and for playing with us. It is definitely an honor to be here with you and to call this my community. Thank you so much. So let's <laughs> say the blessing together. The divine consciousness that I am is forever expressing its true nature of abundance. I bless the gift I have just given. It does perfect work. Thanks, Rachel. Good morning. Good morning. Just a brief reminder that Wednesday at noon, we have our peace meditation with sound healing, and I invite you to come. And also, we have our grief support group every Thursday at 4 o'clock. You can just drop in and join us. You know, in honor of Michael Garavuso, who was the founder of our grief support group, I believe we're going to have a celebration of life Saturday the 20th. And I just didn't have time at the last minute to pull it all together. But I did leave a little, um, like a little mailing sheet on the front table. If you want to be invited, please go ahead and put your phone number or email on, and I'll give you the time. But that should be this, this coming Saturday. Also, The Disappearance of the Universe, that is our book club this month. It's in the mind shop, and I hope uh, you can pick one up. This is a book based on A Course in Miracles. I, for one, I love A Course in Miracles, and this book kind of level jumps people. If you are reading A Course in Miracles, it brings things out so clearly, so beautifully. And uh, the author of this book is going to be here on Saturday, September the 10th, for a one-day workshop. So I invite you uh, to come. It's already filling up very fast. Also your very favorite psychic medium. She's become so popular here, Deb Shepard. She's going to be here for a gallery reading from right, right in this spot. Usually the place is filled up, and she does beautiful readings for people, uh, for the loved ones who have passed. 
So you're also welcome to join us on Thursday, September 29th. You can go on our website and get a ticket for that. And then she's going to stick around for a day or two, and she's going to offer us a two-day workshop called Sacred Soul Contracts. Uncover soul contracts and agreement chosen before your birth. See the higher purpose of your relationships. She talks about our soul groups and spirit guides. It should be a wonderful two-day workshop. The last one she gave sold out. I think she limits it at about 20. So again, that's something you might want to sign up for. We have very special treats in the community room today. Some delicious salad, some beautiful muffins. There's plenty of Baileys for your coffee, lots of whipped cream. <laughs> It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> so please join us in the in the community room afterward. Thank you. This has been a very a very special uh, very special Sunday. Thank you, Dr. Bill and the musicians. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I knew there was something fishy going on. I tell you, <laughs> I knowed it. Yeah. I think we got to write a little kid story about Sammy the singing dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like this one dinosaur wandering around going, I'm flying, I'm flying. And all the old dinosaurs are getting really grumpy and woo woo with their little tiny feet. Um, good. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce without hesitation that Dr. Timothy Wilkin will be having the circle today. Please join. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, so much, and thank you, Reverend Shreya, for all that you did. Thank you, everyone. Dennis, Rachel, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody that sets up in the morning. Good heavens, that is, that's, that's just such a tremendous amount of work, such a service, and that's uh, Michelle and Sylvia and... Whoa, just incredible. Okay, I think pretty much that is us for this week. We will see you in the mind shop. And now, the peace song next week. See you there.